All right. Um, good morning. So I'm conscious. Um, today I'm I'm not so philosophical. <laughs> so my topics will be on the boundedly rational behavior, and uh, I want to look at how we can utilize it in the economic analysis. All right. So um, so basically um. I'm looking at the behavioral economics, which uh, I'm very fascinated with um, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. They are my reference point when I do this study. Yeah. And so probably you'll find that most of my contents is about uh, literature review because I want to introduce what are the concepts that we study in behavioral economics, all right? So um, basically, behavioral economics is focused on how we make decisions, all right? And of course, it's not just using the economics theory, but we are combining with the psychological point or the human behavior side. So here we say, uh, or Simon said, we tend to fall into the trap of heuristic biases, meaning we, we always take shortcut when we make decisions. Right? And of course, we are not to abandon the fundamental neoclassical economics, but rather we complement it with the psychological uh, behavior. And so here, I just want to upfront say that we are not to criticize the neoclassical economy but we, I rather want to know how behavioral model can complement the study on human behavior and further improve the choice architecture. So later on uh, I will just show a few examples for better understanding. Um, of course later on when we clear about how to improve the choice architecture possibility we can look at how we can improve the quality of policy making. Actually, we can do a lot by looking at how we design the policy. All right? So this is my framework when I studied my PhD, but I just want to um, clarify for this framework actually is on real estate investment, but I'm not sure whether it, uh, it is useful for other study also. All right? So basically in my study, I'm looking at when investors make decisions, are they boundedly rational? All right. So here I basically um, divide it into four segments. The first one is the effects of past experience, emotional attachment, cognitive psychology, and conform to the social norm. And out of these four elements, I further um, put in into the small small sections or subsections um, or we call it as the bounded rational behaviors so the first one is accessibility then endowment effect and loss aversion is, is belongs to the emotional attachment anchoring and overconfidence is belongs to the cognitive psychology and the last two will be herding and status quo bias okay so the first one, accessibility. Uh, accessibility, not just accessibility through eyes, through ears, or whatever, but it's more towards the brain or towards the experience. Right? So for this as, uh, accessibility, we think that if, let's say, one person, they have the past experience and they are more easily to relate it to the past experience. So for example, is this person experienced flirt before? All right? So if you approach this person and sell flirt insurance to them, they are more easily to buy in your idea because of the past experience. All right? So how we can take on the accessibility so that we can provide necessary or relevant information to a decision maker so that they can make more informed decisions. Yeah? <coughs> and endowment effect and loss aversion, um, for this experience, uh, experiment is very famous. Um, they are looking at how sellers and buyers look at a mark. If let's say I give you a mark, all right, for different people, the longer that you hold on to the mark, you have the endowment to the mark because let's say for example, the same mark or same cup, you write on your name or you hold on it or you, you drink it every morning using it to drink coffee, 
all right? So if I want to ask you to sell this mark because of the endowment, you put on more value on it. So you probably you just value it as $7. But for a buyer, they just look at the mark as a mark. All right, they don't have feeling on the mark yet. So they will ask for $2.87 to buy this mark from you. So when we as the person or a human, we end up to a pro, uh, uh, an object, then we tend to end up to it. So the value will be different. And here, we, especially for investors, they weigh losses higher than gains. And this is due to the emotional attachment. So in my study, actually, I'm looking at the real estate investors and the buyers. If let's say you buy a property, if you buy it to stay, you don't you, you have the emotional attachment to the property. <coughs> but if you are buy it to invest, then your emotional attachment is lesser because you know that at the end of the day, you are going to sell it off to get capital gain, all right? So emotional attachment can be categorized in two ways. One is endowment effect and loss aversion. Loss aversion basically is like, when you want to sell it, you feel like you don't want to have any loss or you want to have maximum gains before you sell it, all right? And for anchoring, meaning we rely too much on the first piece of info. And for Scott and Lizary, they suggest that with Valuation judgment on a property is heavily influenced by the most recently valued property. So for investors also, if let's say the first piece of property that they view is let's say 100 uh, or 1 million. So they will use the 1 million as the reference point. So whatever property that they go and search for, they will use this 1 million as the reference point. But we do not know whether this 1 million is the correct reference point or it may be blurred the decision making as well all right so this is anchoring and sometimes we are uh, weighted too much on this reference point and it kind of like make our decisions not optimal yeah so this is anchoring and overconfidence because i'm looking at investment i'm not sure about bias so sometimes we are overconfident with whatever information that we have or the past experience that we have and same time at the same time um, we overestimate our capability and it kind of like um, make us to invest in a very risky portfolio without really go through the or assess the portfolio so overconfidence is one of the bounded rational behavior and hurting, I think most of us heard about hurting. We, as human beings, we like to follow people. For example, you go to this restaurant, you see hey, actually nobody, you don't have to walk in. But when you go to another restaurant, you see, oh, a lot of customers in there. Then you kind of like, ah, the, the food's here might be good. Then I just follow. And hurting are very, um, Famous in the behavioral finance as well, because when we make investment, we tend to follow people's choice, or we tend to follow the institutional investors' uh, choice. So here, we always try to conform to the others' behavior. Yeah. So this is um, herding, and we have status quo bias here. Status quo bias is where. We just try to do nothing when we face um, choices or we are uncertain with the new initiative or new opportunities. We just remain status quo. Yeah. But is this status quo good or not good? We do not know. Is it the best strategy? We do not know. But for decision makers, sometimes they just think that as long as I remain status quo, I should be fine. All right. So, um, so here in layman terms, to do nothing can be the best strategy under uncertain circumstances. But sometimes, probably when we do this, we are kind of like lose out the optimal choice. Yeah.
So this is stethoscope bias. So total there are six bounded rational behaviors. We are talking we talk about accessibility, we talk about endowment effect and loss aversion, we talk about anchoring, overconfidence, follow the herd, and stethoscope bias. But how this behavior is going to apply or imply in our daily or in economics terms. So actually here are some of the implications. Let's say for example, we all know that we should go exercise. But most of the time we don't go because of the inertia. Alright? But what if we use this inertia, we put it together with saving. Meaning, if let's say I go exercise, I use the workout machines. When I do exercise, at the same time, it hit jackpot. And this jackpot can become the savings. <coughs> then probably, people will want to do exercise. All right? So this is how we overcome the initial or the status quo. At the same time, encourage people to save. All right? Or... Like this, uh, Taylor and Bernazi, they actually start off with this um, saving program, Save More Tomorrow, which help people to commit to their retirement saving by allocating a portion of their salary for the best of tomorrow. They also make use of the status quo bias, which is people just try to remain status quo. So when we have options for them, let's say I let you to choose whether you want to save 12% <coughs> or all the salary you can just withdraw but the default option is save 12 percent per month people will just leave it as default in a way we kind of like help people to save yeah or if you realize when you go to withdraw money from the atm machine normally you get your card back first or your cash first card back first you get your card first. Yeah. Why? You forget to. Yeah, because you'll forget your card once you get your cash. So sometimes people will just take the cash and leave and you forgot your card. So we use the human behavior that forgetting. We give the card first before you get the cash. So for sure you won't forget your card. So this is where we apply the human behaviors um, I don't say it's a shortfall, but we should make use of it, right? And to promote better choice architecture. And in 2016, if not mistaken, our new um, our budget at that time tried to improve the personal consumption. So they reduced the EPF contributions from 11% to 8%. Of course, the government aim is to promote consumption, but it will be bad for our retirement fund. So how to do it? The 11% will be stay as default, status quo. But if you want to opt for 8%, you have to, I think, fill out a form or inform the HR. It, no, 11% is the default. Yeah. They make you those who want to remain at 11% need to fill out a form. Is it? I don't know. Otherwise, the status quo is <laughs> in contradiction to the status quo, right? You see, you're right. Yeah, if you want to give an incentive, you have to yes, fight yes. from, from the target, right? But I, I don't remember we fill up the form for those who want to remain at 11%. Probably the HR helps. Uh, I, I think so. All of us fill up both or not? Ah. Yes or no? Just think. Oh. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yeah. So if you want to achieve certain um, objective, so we need to make it as default because people is conform to the status quo bias. Yeah. So these are some of the examples. Um, of course, this is just my propositions in real estate investment just for your reference. I think the I don't, I'm not sure why the font is blurred. So what I'm um, trying to further on my study is that how are we going to leverage on these bounded rational behaviors in terms of uh, promoting the transformations of economy? 
Because if you talk about bounded rational, actually can be very individual based. But if we talk about collectively, how are we going to improve the choice architecture in terms of um, to achieve this um, sustainable economic growth in terms of let's say private consumption or how we improve the inequality or even environmental issues, all right? How we make it a default if let's say we want to do recycle or not to recycle or to improve the awareness and so on. And also the industrialized uh, economy, like now we talk about IR 4.0, but how true we are there or are we going there or how. So um, I think we have to um, infuse this um, idea or this ideology in our economic education, start to educate our students or even consumers or even individuals to start to make use of this um, bounded rational behavior to improve our choice so that uh, we know that we are blind spotted but we are not uh, jeopardizing but in a way we improve our choice to achieve the optimal choice which benefit us. Yep. So that's all. Thank you. Okay.